What's up, everybody? Big Herc 916. Getting down with Fresh Out. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit that share button, hit that like button. You know how we do it. We keep it raw and real over here on this channel. And we're looking to break the algorithm and hit that million subs. So support, share the channel. And I have with me here today a special guest. And you know it's special because we don't do Zoom. We always do our interviews in person, but I wasn't able to make it happen in person with this individual, which we will in the future, but I had to get his information out because he has a world of knowledge and uh, just game that you don't hear every day being spoken of. So I have with me here, Akeem from Hindsight Radio, and man, he's going to lace you guys up on some stuff that's going to blow your mind. So um you know, for introduction purposes, Akeem, tell the people a little about about where you're from and um, how you grew up, man. I am Akeem. My full name is Akeem Barber. I grew up in New York City, uh, Brooklyn, New York, New York. I was born in the Bronx, raised in Brooklyn. So um, I was raised uh, my first early toddler years. You know, we we weren't very religious. Then my mom got religious and we became Jehovah's Witnesses. I was raised as a Jehovah's Witnesses. I was the guy who you ran from. <laughs> we knocked on the door, tried to teach. Isn't that you. what Serena and Venus was Jehovah's Witnesses and Michael Jackson? Absolutely. Michael Jackson, Venus, Serena. Uh, it's quite a few people out there that have was exposed to that lifestyle. Okay. Which is a rigorous lifestyle. I know in my my lifestyle it was rigorous. You know, we had three times <laughs> in 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 the Kingdom Hall, of uh, and we had home Bible studies. Then we had field service. So it's pretty much a whole week is occupied by just religious. Wow. Activity. <laughs> you know, I couldn't play with the kids on the block because they were considered worldly, um, and. I, I I did that, you know, up to my teenage years until I rebelled. I left home. You know, I just ran away at 15. And of course, <laughs> of course yeah, he's a rebellion, huh? I, I, well, I, I, well, I kind of, you know, inadvertently rebelled, right? I got, you know, you, there you can, fornication is a big deal. You know, you can get kicked Were out. Was there something inside you that made you kind of like start looking around like, hold on, man, I got to venture outside of this. At first, no. You know, I, I well, let me go back. I always hated Bible study, and you know, just went to the kingdom hall. We always fell asleep for the most part during the <laughs> services. So I didn't enjoy all of it, but I did it because I lived in my parents' home, and my parents were strict on it. You know, my father was, you know, old school. Hey, yeah. you don't do what I say you're gonna get a spanking. He believed in that. Um, so. What, how I got away from it, what started my path away from it was I hooked up with a girl in Kingdom Hall and committed fornication, which is a no-no there. <laughs> so, for, for, for just to be, <laughs> so. <laughs> fornication to get you. through this whole jujitsu thing, you know, they put me on reproof and all of this stuff. And that kind of took me away. And I, you know, just to, not to go into that story too deep, I ended up leaving home going to live with my aunt and I needed a way to make a living. Okay. So I ended up on the streets at 15 selling drugs. Okay. So that went from Bible thumping to thugging on the street. <laughs> so just get, just imagine that picture. I had no experience in the street, nothing, but I did growing up in Brooklyn, you know, you, you pretty much had to fight to, to, to protect yourself, you know, so I wasn't a stranger to conflict. And what was so, the era to give these guys a visualization, like music? Oh, this was like uh, 85. Okay. 85 to, I, I was out there from 85 to like the early part of 87. Okay. Okay. So that's right around, uh, you, you have the emerging of really hip hop really starting. Oh, to I was off. emerging of uh, Chaos One, uh, Boogie, what's it? Boogie Down Productions. Boogie Down Productions. Uh, of uh, uh, Bismarcky, nobody. Public Enemy is public. Oh, Public Enemy, big time. Um, and Big Taddy Kane was on the cuffs for coming in into his own. I think when I was on my way out of the streets, he was becoming bigger. Uh, who else? It's, it was a lot of groups that back there. Oh, MC Light. MC Light. That's right. That's right. You had MC Shan back then. 
Ken, um, D Nice, D Nice. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, it's just so many Beastie Boys. Oh yeah, Beastie Boy and Run. I mean, that whole okay. thing with the they start that whole fashion. Yeah, right? yeah. With the you know the Adidas, the, the sweatsuits, uh, you know the gold, the chains, and everything. Yeah. Yes, uh, Brass Monkey. Remember that Brass yep, Monkey? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. We bumping all that. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah. so I'm yeah. a little dude. That was a, that was. You know what? When you, now that you brought that up, that was the golden age of hip hop. That's like groundbreaking. You could go back to that hip hop and listen to it. Even in this generation, I believe the the, the youngsters who didn't grow up during that time would would appreciate that rap. Well, you know what you you know what you just said is you can listen to it with a youngster and not feel offended because it wasn't no cussing, right? Right. They didn't it wasn't no, no fornication in the lyrics. That. It wasn't offensive. Right. You could listen to it with somebody going to church and it wouldn't make them feel like, oh my god, turn it off. Right. And, and don't let's not forget Fat Boys. Oh yeah, yeah, the Fat <laughs> Boys. I forgot about them. Fat yeah. Boys, yeah, the beatbox. Yeah. And, uh, and what's his name? Uh, oh, the... don't forget about Roxanne Chante. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! yeah Remember that? Rocks in, yeah. Yep. UTFO. UTFO. Yeah, that was yeah. a. That was. You know what? To be honest with you, that was the start of the battle rap. Yep. Yep. You UTFO. That, that yep. was the first time you had the battle rap going back and forth. You know, addressing each other in 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 the uh, rap. Yep. I forgot about UTFO, man. They were classic, man. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Oh, uh, what's the other guy? Houdini. Houdini. Yeah. Houdini. <laughs> We, we can keep going, though. I know, I know, man. You make me want to go listen to an old school right now. Oh, see, when I was out there hanging out on the streets, I had my big boom box, walking around with it, <laughs> you know, and that's what we used to play was that. And breakdancing was a big thing back then. You know who the first gangster rapper back then? Um, Schooly D. Oh, you know what? I... I, I, I missed that guy. That Schooly one. D I, was hard, man. Schooly D. I remember when I first heard him, and um, I'm like, dang, he was like from New York, but he was hard. He was in, um, they used his song in that soundtrack, King of New York with Christopher Walken. Remember that? King of New I, York with a classic out there. I don't remember the name, Scooby-Doo. Okay. D. Yeah, I when don't... you get a chance, when you look up King of New York, it had uh, Lawrence Fishburne, one of his first roles. Oh, was that the one of, I remember the 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 the, uh, the song for, uh, the movie you just mentioned. Remember King of New York with Christopher King. Walken just got out the pen. Yeah. And he had a crew and they yeah. were taking over New York. And yeah, I remember and, that. And I think Wesley Listen. was Wesley Snipes in there as a cop to one of his first roles. He I might have it was a lot of a lot of people, it was like back in the day, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was an era of good movies for. For for black folks, that was a I remember a lot of good movies came out during that yeah. time too. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so I, I went on and I was out there selling drugs, got uh busted. Of course, you, you be out there long enough, you're gonna catch a charge. And I ended up getting of uh, I I I had just turned like I was 16, 15. I turned sixteen, and, and in New York you have the youth offender, but I had just turned. The age where they could charge you as an adult, but they still mm. charge me as a youthful offender. So I got five years probation for that. And um, and I, I when I was out there, I was like, you know, this is not how I was raised. And it's it's causing me to do things that I, you know, being on the street, you have to change your whole mentality. You know, you gotta have a sort of like a killer instinct, meaning. You can't take stuff off of people and you got to, you know, protect yourself. But I was always, I looked at people who came before me who would say, yo, man, we used to do this. I, I you know, I used to make all this money, but now they're my customer. Mm. Taking my product. And I'm looking at these guys say, well, where, what are my choices here? Am, either I'm going to be, I can continue to do this. I, my, box, my, my limit would be this neighborhood. I could get hooked on the stuff I'm selling or be dead. That's what my what I, I kept looking at. Because every time I met someone who used, yeah, that guy, he used to be balling back in the day. You know, he used to, he used to be getting money back in the day. That's the word, how we put it in New York. He used to get money back in the day. And I'm looking at this guy. He's all strung out on uh, angel dust now. 
the one you smoke, you know, this couple of types. So I'm like, he used to be balling. Now look at him. This is where I'm like, this. I'm just looking at the future here. And then one day, um, our spot got busted, but I happened to not be there. You know, this is after I had got on probation and everything. I'm still trying to do my thing out there. And I had no money. I had nothing. And I was totally broke. Because, you know, out there, you fast, you get it, you spend it. There's no, because you got people giving you street logic. Oh, you can't put it in the bank. You can't do this. You know, when you don't understand the rules to the game, when really you can't put anything over 10 grand in there, then they give you a problem. Yeah, yeah. I, I I was listening to the street like, man, you put money, they're going to come do this. Just all this ignorant stuff. People who didn't even have a bank account telling me what to do about a bank account. Right. You know, but I didn't realize this until I got older, how ignorant the street was, you know. So. I'm sitting in my aunt's house, no money, spots busted. You got to figure no money to re up to do anything. And I just said, man, I have enough. I had enough of this. <laughs> you know, I'm going to go get me a job. That's what I'm going to do. And the only thing I, I had a mindset for was getting a messenger job. So I said, okay, I don't have any money. I'm a hop the turnstile. I, I, I had planned this all in my head before I left my aunt's house. I said, I'm a hop this turnstile and there's going to be a newspaper on the seat. I'm going to look at that newspaper and I'm going to find a place to a job out of that newspaper. So I hopped the turnstile, grabbed the newspaper that was sitting right there. As soon as I got on the train, it was sitting right in my field division on the seat, laying there, grabbed it, turned it to the one ads. This is what, for the young people back in the day, we had one ads. <laughs> we didn't have <laughs> and all these other things. We had one ads and they were in the newspaper. So I found a job and the name of the company was advanced communications i never forget the name uh because that that company set the stage for where i am today so i i looked at it i said well i don't have any money i gotta call them so i'm gonna get off the next stop i'm gonna catch the, there's gonna be a pay phone sit, sit in there and it's gonna be money in there somebody's gonna leave some money in there i'm gonna get that money out of it. i'm gonna make the phone call right yeah. So, like, I had no doubt that there was going to be money there. I had no doubt that the newspaper was going to be sitting there. For some reason, something was directing me. That sounds like a scene from The Matrix. Remember when they were running to get the phone? Right. <laughs> I get to the I get to the uh, phone, get off the next stop. Sure enough, money was in there to make the phone call. I made the phone call, called the place and said, hey, come on down. You need to fill out an application. Uh, it was in Lower Manhattan. Um, near where the World Trade Center was. Well, uh, maybe about three or so miles away. But get down there. And I, I say, hey, I'm here for the messenger position. He said, well, fill out the application. I'm out there filling out the application. And let me set the scene. I'm up. They had this like little shelf against the wall. Um, and it was a guy here to the left and a guy here to the right. I'm in the middle filling out the application. Then I hear someone, the guy, same guy say, hey, hey, you over there, uh, you know how to get to the World Trade Center? I'm ignoring him because I, I, I said, there's no way he's talking to me, right? So I thought he was talking to somebody he knew because the way he, you know, he talked like he was familiar. And then the guy said, hey, he's talking to you. So I said, oh, oh, I didn't quite know, but I said, hey, I could find out. So I just kind of played, played along he said, well, I need you to go to Fort Worth World Trade Center and go see a guy named Joe V. Right? I said, okay. Right? Then let me just help you see the significance of this to show you that something was directing me away from the streets. To the right of me and the left of me, they were dressed for a job interview. I was wearing stonewashed lime color jeans and i had like a white dress shirt on and i had uh sneakers on i was nowhere near dressed for a job but that's all i had because i was running the streets you know you know when you're in the streets you're not 
putting on suits and ties. Although my father instilled to me on how to dress for a job, I didn't have any clothes for a job. So, um, I, um, I said, but I didn't realize the significance of that until like later on when I, after I had been in the job, well, I said, man, you wasn't even dressed for a job and you got this job. When I started to look back on things, I started to realize the significance of that. So I get to, to the World Trade Center. I said, go to the security desk. And the guy said, I said, I'm looking for uh, Joe V. So they call her Joe V, but instead this guy named Michael Drury came to the desk. You know, black guy. He came and got me. He said, oh, you here for the uh, the runner position? I said, yes. Take me out there. And I go into this room, and it opens up. And it's got all these numbers running across the board. Right. And I hit I see guys dressed in different color jackets, badges on. And I see coffee, sugar, cocoa to my left. I see crude oil. I see platinum, gold and silver. Right now, I still haven't kind of realized where I was. Until like a week went by of me working. I asked Mike Drew, I said, what is this place? He said, <laughs> Why is these guys yelling? He said, well, if you want a bankroll, you'll yell. I said, so, so really, he said, well, you, do you know Trading Places? You see that movie, Trading Places? And they were in that room yelling and stuff. I said, yeah, I've seen that movie, the one with Eddie Murphy. He said, yeah, this is the place where they filmed part of those scenes. Mm. Said, the Commodities Exchange Center, New York Mercantile Exchange Dang, Center. Yeah. So I went from the streets with no, I had no... I didn't even have a high school diploma at the time. I lied on the application to get the job. And I ended up there. And from there, I worked for Dow International, brokerage firm, Payne Weber, brokerage firm. Payne Weber was a big international. I remember Payne Weber. Yes. Uh, I worked for a company called Refco. And from there, working at the New York Mercantile Exchange, I ended up working for a guy. I'll never forget him. I have to call his name. His name was Frank Belcastro. He was an Italian guy. He saw me working for the New York Merc Mercantile Exchange. He said, hey, I like your work ethic. Hey, I want you to come work for me. So I ended up going working for a, a broker himself, like a local broker. And I met at this place, I met people like Robbie Downey Jr., he, he like he they these people came to these places. I've I've mm. actually came face to face with him. The Marvel of uh, the, the, the Marvel guy. Iron Man. Chief Sweat actually worked for Payne Weber at one point. Wow. Actually, when I came to work for Payne Weber, he was just leaving because his his album had taken off. I wanna. So but what I'm telling this story because you can start off one way, but you don't have to end up the same way. You could be in a situation where I went to the streets because I, I you know, no one would hire me. They would say, oh, I got to say I was too small to get to work at Woolworth, taking out trash. I couldn't even get that type of job. Right. And and then because I didn't have the high school diploma in some places, but I end up these jobs that were taking out trash and stuff wouldn't hire me. I ended up working in a world class job. <laughs> With no de no degree or anything, and and it took me places. And then you know, I, I you know, I, in nineteen ninety three ninety four, I moved south and started a family. You know, because I got laid off, and I started. Now I own a couple of businesses. Now uh, I own a trucking company, and I have Hindsight Radio. Um, that I do. I do a show weekly, and most of my show now is about just changing the mindset it, it, outside circumstances is not your problem people are not your problem it's your mindset that's the problem yeah. how you see things how you your perception and when i look back at everything that i put myself through then i i you i say that with emphasis the things that are the problems i have is because i put myself through it by the mindset that i had mm -hmm. at the time. do you so, think um that exposure um, you know, that opportunity that was that uh, you really created for yourself through whatever universal energy 
that that opened up that whole Wall Street opportunity. Do you think that made you look at things differently? Because I I told oh, people definitely. all the time, you know, oh. <clears throat> that I, I worked in um, natural gas limited partnerships at one point. A guy hooked me up, but I ended up losing a job because they found I had a felony, so I couldn't get a Series Seven. But I had a Series Twenty Three, and you know, I was around those guys, and you know, I've seen guys close guys for you know, a couple hundred thousand and, you know, they're clapping. It's like boiler room. And I'm like, I, I was so young. I couldn't, I seen it. But when later on in life, when I reflect back on it, I'm like, it's a, it's exposures. It's something different from the streets. And it makes you look at life differently and how you interact with people. That me working, I know God directed my steps there because it helped me see, because I, I grew up in a, in Bethesda, Stuyvesant, in Brooklyn all my life. Right. So my viewpoint of money in, 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 in success was very limited. Plus, I had a very religious mindset because of how I was raised. <clears throat> uh, when I got there, I saw guys pulling out bankrolls like hundreds, and I'd never seen that before. And I used to feel ashamed because I didn't have a high school diploma. Like, I lied my way through there, you know, working at this place. Um, and that's a whole nother story. But... I remember talking to one of the brokers who didn't, a lot of, you'd be surprised, a lot of those guys didn't have college degrees or they had GEDs working in at that time, right? So I talked to one of the brokers. I said, hey, you ever thought about going back to college and getting a degree? You know, he's like, Gene, why? <laughs> I, I wouldn't do that. I'm, I'm a millionaire. Wow. I would be guys. To go, I'll pay them for that. They pay for the education. I'll just pay them to do what I need them to do. The guys with the degrees. And most of the people that had degrees there didn't make a lot of money. They were working for these brokers. Wow. You see? So that changed my viewpoint of regular education or secular education. That, yeah, I think it's a good thing to be educated. But my motto is, what are you educating yourself on? You know, it, have education, but is it useful? Because most people, you know, I, I've been in management positions. Like even when I worked at Payne Weber, I was in a position where I was training people who had degrees and I didn't. You know, so like. It's all about what you're going to school for. And is it useful because most people are going to get a degree and it's not useful for making any kind of living, you know, they, you know, you're competing with thousands of people for the same job, you know, it's almost like that quote, <clears throat> which was one of my favorite movies, wall street. When Gordon yeah. Gekko said, give me somebody who's hungry. I'll take him any day over Ivy league graduate. You know I me? Mean? Cause it's, it's that hunger. And when I think of like, when I, I visualize this looking at, you know, hearing your story and seeing other people yelling and they're doing the signs and they're buying and selling. And yeah. I always looked at that like, man, I, that's like the streets to me. That's like, yeah, ugh, you know what I mean? It's intense. And those guys, like you said, millionaires and most of these guys barely made, they didn't, most of them didn't graduate. No. I mean, I know guys that didn't even, uh, they had maybe 10th grade educations, 9th grade educations, and they were millionaires down there. Wow. Now, now they had a lot of college, at, you know, at on the cups of, you know, the end of the 80s, Coming into the nineties, you had a lot of preppies that came in there with their suit and ties, but it was always this conflict between the preppies and the the guys who <laughs> the school guys that had been there for years, where they built, they basically built these places. You know, it came from fam generations of people working there. So, mm -hmm. I, I figured out real quick that education is important. Depends on what you're learning, right? Yeah. I got to ask you a question because <clears throat> I know when I went to work at the place I worked at for partnerships, there was, um, there was no, uh, there was no brothers working there. And the one brother that did work there, he was like, he had no high school education. He didn't even have a GED, but he was technically, he wasn't supposed to close people on the phone without a license because that's like a violation, but he was so good that they gave him a pass because he was, he had a way with words. And I mean, I said, this brother came in no socks on with those shiny shoes, looked like Rick Fox. But right. that's the first time I seen a brother 
with that type of power in a position, which is usually controlled by white America. I'd never seen that like that. Right, right. Were there any brothers there that you've seen that was on that level? Yeah, plenty. Uh, see, he worked in the actual office. He worked in the office. I worked on the trading floor where everything starts. Those guys that are working in the office are sending trades down to the floor that where I worked. Okay. You have brokers on different levels. You have brokers in the office who, like, like you said, you needed a Series Sevens license because, and that license just says you can give financial advice. That's basically what it is, right? <laughs> so, and the the those guys talk to the customers and get mm -hmm. them best and take that money and trade it, send it down to us on the trading floor. So one of my functions was my main function. I was a clearing clerk. So everything like say today was a trading day. I had to make sure my clearing house received all trades that they were supposed to have and any trades they didn't know. I had to either get an account for them or uh, remove them from my house. Because what it does, if you have a trade on your books, and it would uh, throw your numbers off. It's like your bank statement. If you put 100 bucks in the bank, and then you go tomorrow, look at your statement, that 100 bucks is not there. I was the guy to go find that 100 bucks <clears throat> into your account. So okay. you're talking about a guy who came from the streets who now I'm talking to people all over the world. Chile, Chile. Uh, <laughs> I, I, there's so many countries I talk to, people would call me that make sure their accounts were straight. So, and this is a guy with no high school diploma doing this. That's amazing. <laughs> but to get there, I had to learn. I had to learn fast. You know, I had to learn really fast. But it, it's a job anybody can do if they put their mind to it and willing to learn. See, that's the education I'm talking about. See, I got educated on the job. And by me learning real fast, I became invaluable. People came to me and wanted me to work for them. So what happened was I took the street ethic there because I was a uh, when I was on the streets, I wasn't about robbing people. Although I was doing something wrong by selling drugs to my community, I had an ethic about me. You know, I'm not going to take you for your money. You're going to get what you pay for. Although a lot of people beat me, <laughs> you know, I wasn't the guy to beat people out of their money. Um, but I took that same work ethic and brought it into that environment, you know, because I got on the streets and I moved up really quick, you know, because I was so trustworthy. People, hey, you can handle this, watch this, do this. So I went from like that corner dude to being inside the apartment, looking over, making sure money was straight. So, so I took that to the, to the, to the, to the world, to the Wall Street, and I applied that same ethic. Do work hard. And I moved up really quick. You know, I was making the kind of income at my age. I was at the time when I went there, I was like 19, 18, 19 when I went there. Uh, I was making money most people in their 30s weren't making. Mm. You see, <laughs> you know, the kind of, and then just the prestige of having a job like that. Yeah. So that. Yeah, I always said, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I always tell people, um, because I've like seen so many different levels of society. Mm -hmm. I and mean, I tell people don't get stuck in one low level. But I remember one time a, a pimp told me in prison, he's like, you know, because somebody was questioning him because he didn't have his hair all combed right and this and that. And he's like, look, man, these dudes in here, I would never see them on the street. He said, mm -hmm. seagulls fly with seagulls and eagles fly with eagles. He Absolutely. said, you're, you're not going to even be flying in my world, man. I would do, you would. I would never see you. You're only fortunate enough because I'm here in prison with you that you even can see a dude like me. Right. Absolutely. That's true. He that what he said was very profound. And yeah, I thought I, I remember clear as day. Very profound because too many of us are e eagles trying to fly with people that are not eagles. That ain't gonna fly. We, yeah, yeah. we you the eagle, but you started and that and I did that when I went to the World Trade Center. I wanted to go back because I wanted to just love the bomber. And, you know, at the time, when I first got there, I was only making $3,000.35 an hour. That ain't even $200 a week when I first got there. And I wanted to make some fast money to buy this leather bomber. 
I did it. And it show you how God lets you go out there and do something stupid. Right? One time. And I and I made it money, got the the blood of the bomb. I decided to go back out there and continue the stupidity. And I got busted again. Now I'm still on probation from the other charge. Remember, I talked about that. And the probation officer said, You get indicted, you're gonna go to I'm gonna have you locked up and you're gonna have to do your five years just off the indictment. Right now, I'm at the World Trade Center. Just got a job. Where I went from advanced communication as a run as a temporary, and I just got a job with the Mercantile Exchange, New York, with the actual exchange. And I just got landed the job. All this happened at the same time. I'm like, dang. And I was like, regretting. I came. Why did you have to go back out there? So, and I prayed on that thing, and I went to my first appearance, the first court case. I got this. I never forget the Italian guy, short Italian man, he came and asked me what happened. I told him some bogus story. You know, I I did this, and you know, they just they just thought I was this. Uh, I had I was the best dressed, and that's why they picked me. Right. He went up there, talked to the prosecutor. They called my name. I get up there. And then the prosecutor said, hey, we're going to dismiss this case due to lack of evidence. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I mean, who gets that? You know, you, you, got, gotta, a, you got a cold blessing. Right. He's like, and I'm like, and, and then the judge looks at, what do you, what do you, what do you want? You know, what do you, what do you say to that? And I'm stuck. I'm like stunned. Like, what is he talking about? Now, I just got off the streets, got this job. I'm about to lose it all and go to prison. And and the the the, the, the lawyer nudged me, said, hey, you know, just say you agree. And I said, yes, I, I, I agree. He walked out, he shook my hand. He looked at me, he said, don't let me ever see you in here again. <laughs> don't let me ever, ever see you. <laughs> right? So I was like, thank you. I shook his hand. I, I bet I wanted to hug that man. And when people say you get a public defender of bad lawyers, I, this guy was on point. You know, he oh, wow. he looked out for me. Yeah, you but looked out. I think it was my presentation because I just I went to court with a suit on, dressed up, told him, "Hey, I'm working. I'm trying to work." I I think he had a heart for me, and he he he. he I don't know what he said to them. I don't know what he said, but the, whatever he said, they dismissed it. I walked out there. I never looked back. I after that. Let me tell you, anybody that's listening. And you out there, you 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 always gonna get that voice that's gonna say, "Hey, you need to quit, and you need to do it now before something really bad happens." Listen to the voice because that's whatever you want to call it, God, divine inspiration. That's the warning. I know so many guys because I I tend to ask people things, and I remember when we, you and I first talked, I asked you that same question: Was there something telling you? Before things really went bad for you, yeah, could have prevented all of that. And almost all everybody I talk to, they say the same thing. The difference between me and them, I listened. <laughs> I listened. I said, "No, this, this. I got my little tap on the shoulder. You got your job, and I didn't look back. You know, things. I probably wouldn't even be talking to you guys right now if I didn't listen." You know, we don't have to be on the streets. We don't have to go and do what the, the stereotypes say we got to do to make yeah, money. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I we think, don't. Have um, and, and um, you know, it, it's so crazy because I'm like, when you, when you talk about a job like that, which I wanted to work on, I'm, you know, I seen that on TV, but everybody around me worked manual jobs. I'm like, damn, man, I don't want to do that. How can I use my brain or how can, so I was always on a search, a quest as a kid. And, and you know, I want to be a business owner or a CEO. And I look at GQ magazines and fantasize about a job where I had a position like that, but I had no point of reference. I knew nobody that was a CEO, Wall right. Street guy, lawyer, a doctor. I've never met anybody that looked like me that was in, in any of those positions. Right, right. You, so, you, and that's I, me until the World Trade Center that exposed me to a whole new world. It exposed me to a whole new way of looking at money. Just being around. I mean, I was working around guys who used to be ex NFL players. You know, there was one guy that his badge number was his badge name was Cowboy. He used to work for the play for the Dallas Cowboys. Mm. He was just do was the biggest white boy I ever seen. 
he was huge. Then I worked for uh, I worked with a guy named Randy Clark, who was the defensive back for the Miami Dolph Dolphins. Mm. Right. So you could go look these guys' names on the route on their rosters. So it put me. I came in there with a very street mentality, very limited mentality on money, but the broker, that's why I always give thanks to Frankie, Frank Bad Castro. They used to call him Frankie Olds. Um, he taught me. And he he didn't, he had a GED. <laughs> the, the broker I worked for had a GED. He, <laughs> that's crazy. He taught me. He said, man, man, you don't have to be on the street to make money. He said, how I got my money to be here? He said, I'm an anomaly here. You know, most of these guys got their money from their family to be here. I worked my ass off to get my money. What he did was he sold ties, neckties. Mm. And he told me, he said, how do you figure out the price of a hot tie? You open it up, this little fold, and it has lines in it. Every line represented $1. So if the tie it had one line in it, that, that tie would, would cost a dollar. So he was taking two, three dollar ties and selling them for 20 bucks. And he that's he made his money off of that to get into the world trade center mm. to, to, you know, to wow. see, to, to trade. So he, he came from a hard beginning. He was an Italian dude, you know, <clears throat> he grew up in a, in a rough neighborhood as well. You know, a lot of people think that black folks is the only people that grew up in bad neighborhoods. That's not true. Yeah. It's, it's Irish, it's, Italian all over the place, you know, yeah. I'm in the South now and you got to, you know, what they call the trailer parks. So if every if people, we're not having to be in the hood is not just for us. <laughs> we are not the only ones who dealt with that. But what I see with us is, and I have a big problem with is we use it as an excuse not to be successful. Yeah. Use that as an excuse. Yo, oh, I, I I was raised up wrong. I didn't have my daddy. I didn't my mama this and this and that. We making all types of excuses. And there is no excuse. You, you, if you want to live good, you're going to have to work for it. And you're yeah. going to have to work hard for it. Yeah. You know, you got to do it. You know, you, you, what's your other choice? Be on the street? Go to jail? You know, we we already got a bunch of guys already down that path who... Who, who fit those stereotypes. We don't need any more adding to that. There's plenty of people in the area of poverty. This is what I say. There's, there's plenty of people that want to be in that poverty mindset, yeah. that broken mindset, broke mind mindset. But at the top, there's not enough. There's so much money to go along, go out, mm -hmm. go, go around up there. There's not enough to go around. I mean, there's enough. There's so much to go around up there. Just think about it. You, thousands of people go for the same job. All the broke people go for the same job, right? And they all we all scrambling, fighting each other to get this job or do whatever. Or at the bottom, the key is go for the top. That's where all the money is, and ain't enough people up there to get it. Well, you know, a perfect example. Look at FTX, Sam Bankman Fraud. Man, this guy, young kid, he was playing. Uh, what is it, Warcraft, why he was trading billions of dollars? I mean, wow. this guy was still dealing with people who are institutional investors. I mean, uh, what's his name? Um, the guy from uh, uh, Shark Tank, he, he, you know, he got took and he's like trying to now clean his rep up by saying he's going to investigate and do an audit. I mean, but that's how this kid with an afro sitting there clowning, drinking energy drinks was, like you said, dealing with billions of dollars, man, based on the introductions he had from his his family, of course, was connected. Right, man. See, that's a good example to show you that there's no reason why we can't make any money. There's no reason why we can't be successful. There is nothing out there. There's no reason other than the fact that you're dead that you can't make money. No, this is no right. the only see, and this is what I've been doing on my show lately is. I have to get to the mind in order to get you to understand anything else. Because I can show you how to get out of debt, because those are one of the things I teach. I like I help uh get rid of over ninety one thousand dollars worth of student loans with just one letter. Right? Sent the letter, they sent paid in full, and, and that person didn't pay one dollar. 
of that mm. one. But this is what it, with education, the proper education is key. And you're not going to get this in school. You just read the fear debt collection practice is at. You read the, the uh, what do you call the, uh, the there's, a, there's another act, a uh, 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 law that Who's you the lending? That one is the one of fear, fear credit reporting. Fair credit report. Oh, fair, yeah, fair, fair, fair credit report, credit reporting act or something. I know what you're talking right. about. Right. You got to read those rules because in those rules, that's what handcuffs banks. Remember, most people when they go to school, they take out student loans, right? And it, the, the 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 whoever the financial aid counselor they take care of that and all of that, and a bank takes that risk on. But then they transfer. Who who's collecting debts from people? Nail net. Oh, uh, Fed loans, Navient. These are all services. And because they're services, they fall under the Fair Debt Collection Practices mm -hmm. Act as debt collectors. They are not they, they have no right to enforce that debt. Right. They have no rights, but they have certain rights. They have limited rights. Let's put it like that. They have limited rights to collect the debt. And what most there's a couple of things most people don't understand about debt. When a debt collector calls you, you have to give him permission to even make that first contact. Why? Because you never signed a contract with that person, number one. You never did that. Uh, then, whenever they're transferring these debts, it's got to be accurate. Right? You, They have to have accurate filing. And guess what? Almost all the time, those records are not accurate at all. They think about this. Most people do, do their loans on a computer online, right? Now, when you understand contract law, contracts are enforceable by the signature. So if I take out a loan and I'm online, who's to say in a court of law, if you want to take me to court for this debt where evidence is key, who's going to prove that I was sitting behind the computer and I signed off on that debt? Who's going to say they saw me do that? That could have been my mama, my cousin, who did it for me. So someone else made me liable for the debt, but I didn't actually do it. No one knows, right? <laughs> so once you understand how the court works and evidence and you need first people, someone with firsthand knowledge of the situation and, and they have to swear by affidavit and they have to swear in open court that they have firsthand knowledge, most people being taken to court are being taken to court by lawyers with no firsthand knowledge. Mm. Lawyers cannot testify in court. They can only bring evidence by way of affidavit and sworn testimony. So when a lawyer is sitting there saying, well, he did this and he did that, you got to shut him down. Hey, uh-uh, you don't have firsthand knowledge of this. Bring someone here that does or you have no case. You know, so... But the courts let these lawyers get away with that because it's just a what you call the way they've been doing business. So, but once you understand things like that, you can shut down every debt collection case there is. And what people don't know, even if you got a judgment against you, you can go void that judgment because the judge allowed them to win without proper evidence being entered into the case. Mm. Because what? Even though, even like some people say, well, I lost because I got defaulted. It was by default, right? And even if you didn't show up to court, you can go back and have that voided. Because even if the person is not there, that lawyer must have certified sworn evidence, not just his word saying that you owed the debt. And a lot of times these lawyers only bring an <clears throat> affidavit from the bank from someone who doesn't have firsthand lot of saying, here, my computer records say this. That's not evidence. Your computer records, how do you know those computer records are accurate? You see, who's going to swear that they decertify under well, penalty? Well, don't they have to have two? If they say, if you bring an affidavit, the only thing that can rebut an affidavit is an affidavit? Yes. Uh, uh, it's called uh, unrebutted affidavit stands as truth. Meaning, anytime they bring an affidavit, you rebut that. Yeah, because there's been people free from that. You can you can just have that that affidavit stricken if it's not proper evidence. Correct. Yeah. Right. You have it stricken from the record. 
So, and all of the stuff I've learned, I learned from a lawyer. There's a, a if you go to my, on my website, I I have a link to this lawyer who teaches people how to fight their case or represent themselves properly. He goes through the whole uh, what's a complaint, how to respond to a complaint, how to create a complaint. He goes through the whole thing, a, a lawyer. So, and it, <clears throat> I, I, I didn't mean to stop your momentum, but you, you have me, you have my brain racing. Because uh, this is what I tell dudes, right? You guys think you're a gangster because you were out here, you had a pistol, maybe you drew down on your ops, you was running around in the street, putting it down. You had a couple of little bras you was beating on, you know what I mean, busting their cheeks. But you get up in the court, you don't even know what a black law dictionary is. You don't know what a statute is. You don't know what a code is. You don't know when it, and they ask you, are you under any threat, duress, or coercion? You don't even know what that means. And I, when I found out, when I was sitting there and I started to start researching, like you said, and I got around some dudes who were sharp, who were, I'm like, man, I played myself. I played myself. Right, right. Like a lot of people don't understand words. The words they're saying in court doesn't, you can't go look at those words in a dictionary and, and get the answer. You know, for instance, if I say the word person, this person, Right, just in general, people gonna say, "Oh, you talk about him, that person over there, that, that guy walking over there." But in law, a person means something totally different. It means an individual, a corporation, a trust, an unincorporated association. All of those are considered persons. Yes, yes. So if, in, so, so if you're in the courtroom and they say, "Are you this person?" You got you got to be. Hey, wait. What do you mean by this person? How, who are you addressing? Are you addressing a church, a trust? Are you just in a corporation? You got to make them be clear. Mm -hmm. But we just say, yeah. Oh, uh, just we just we just answer. Now think about this. What what most people don't even catch. You know, the light, lay person won't even catch this. If you ever watch court cases on TV, and they convict the guy. The first thing the bailiff brings him is a piece of paper to sign. <laughs> now, and I can't, and then when I say this, I say to people, I said, if I got to sign it, then it must be voluntary. Why do I have to? You just convicted me. You sent me off somewhere. Why do I need to sign off on this? What does that mean? I <laughs> know, man. I don't get too deep on that, but what I'm saying yeah, is, I know. I, this... I have to pay attention to what's going on. Why am I signing something? And I always get to tell people, I said, anytime they were asking you to sign something, it's voluntary. Just keep that in your mind. Because yeah. no one can force you to sign anything. Yeah. That's a that's you, you that's your one of what they call an unalienable right. No one can make me sign anything. Yeah. But people, well, they had me sign this. No, they took your hand and made you do this. Think about yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Right? It, it's definitely, I mean, that, you know, one of the one of the things I think is part of like, even like the financial aspect is not tied at home. And, you know, that in itself is, is just like a disloyalty. But on top of it is knowing the law. That's why most like families who came from anything of prestige, they had a doctor, they had a lawyer, and they had an accountant in the family. So that way they could always go get advice from people they had relations with so they wouldn't be took. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. And they're thinking, oh, man, I, I got this accountant. You see it all the time. NBA guys getting robbed, their accountant took money, got rid of this. They did an event behind their back. All kind of crazy stuff, man. And the same thing with like, you know, you talk about legal advice. I mean... You know, unless you know somebody, because always somebody always says, "Oh man, I know this guy." Well, unless you really have somebody behind closed doors breaking stuff down to you, because TV and Hollywood is what top people these these like these drama shows. They oh, so all these guys that are playing out in prison. I've seen they used to watch uh, Law and Order or this other show, and it's like, dude, court that's so fake. That's not the real law. You know. I think one of, yes, it's all fake, but then one of the realest episodes that I saw of Law and & Order, and it was a lawyer representing this defendant, and he said, when they said the people, the people of New York versus the guy, the lawyer said, who is the people? Like, who is this people that, that he's supposed to have committed a crime against? 
And then, then the judge like, oh, that's enough of that, dear. I was like, <laughs> shows tell you the truth, right? <laughs> they would tease to- you with that, though. They throw that out there. And yeah. then you like, at home, you're like this, like, who was <laughs> that? What was that? But when you really understand the law and what you're talking about, you used to get to know, okay, what, what that scene was all about. And they do it all the time. But now that I'm in a place where I know things, I catch it. Like I say, oh, I see what they're doing there. And that's where, I, you know, people should, if you're trying to grow, you should always be trying to educate yourself, always trying to read up on things. And you need to read up on the things that affect you the most. And that's contracts. The job, you know, if you just understood the W-4 form, that would liberate your mind. Just understanding what you're doing there. Um, so that's what I do. I, I take people to the laws that affect them the most. And one of the things, you know, one of the key things that I do deal most with is people with debt. And I'm, I've been, I'm very successful. You know, how I'm successful, I got rid of my own student loan debt <laughs> just by sending letters and, in 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 understanding and in in looking at the responses and, and and got it off without having to pay it you see because once you understand what those rules are we all playing the game whether we know it or not everybody out there is part of this game now you could be a, a willing participant of the game or ignorant to pis- participant of the game but you are in this game now my thing is you need to learn the game and once you learn the game and the rules, you understand that life is pretty simple and easy. <laughs> once you understand the rules to the game, just go read them. Yeah. You know, just like most people want to go open up a business. Oh, I want to open up this business. But they don't really understand what it is to own a business. What kind of liability you put in yourself when you own a business? Should I be the guy on the paperwork that owns this business? Or maybe I can create it. People don't know that another entity can own another entity. One business can own another business or set up a trust with a business trust where a business trust is running the business. You know, I always tell people, don't ever be the person who owns the business. Be the person who controls the business. That's it. That's where the power is when you control it and you have other things own it. So, those are the things I specialize in, showing people how to restructure their business or even structure their business where they can get the maximum privacy and asset protection. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people you open up LLCs and they make themselves the member, right? So what happens? You become a, you become a disregarded entity and all of the tech money you're making you got to show that on your tax return. That That's you. You are responsible. So you're being taxed at a high rate. Just, you know, or, you know, when if you would have just created an LLC and made another LLC or made a trust on that business or another uh, a tax exempt nonprofit business on that business. And you just be what you call the manager, someone who controls everything. Mm. It, but most people, we didn't get this knowledge in school and they did it on purpose because they, they in school, schools to teach you to get an education. This is the model. Get an education. Get a good job. That's it. That's all they're pumping out. Go get it. Get this education so you can go get a job. No, no, don't get to, get this education so you can go start your own business. It's always go become a slave for someone else. Go be somebody else's employee, not you the employer. That's what children are being taught from kindergarten to 12th grade. And even in college, they're still talking about that. Right? Yeah, the only way I see like breaking that cycle, which, you know, you were fortunate because you got exposed to some things which open up your mind. So when you heard other things, you were susceptible. But I know that if you haven't, even been if you haven't had a, a scraping of the surface of this type of knowledge, it has seemed foreign to you. Because like I, going back now, like when I hear things that I heard when I was younger, I'm like, damn, that's what they were talking about. That's how they're able to, you know, they said, oh, so and so made um, forty, fifty million, and he only paid he thousand dollars in taxes. He's a cheat in the system. 
I'm like, nah, man, he knows something we don't know. He knows he, the game. System. Uh, it, it, he's working the system. The, those codes are written for the rich folks. They're not written for poor people. They're, ri- they're written for a certain class of people in a certain area. And it shows why. They paid the right people to educate them on it. The regular education system is not educating you on financial matters, right? How to work a bank account, what you know, what to do with a bank account, how to start business. They're not doing that. But the people who are in the know in these areas are going to take those classes to understand their taxes, understand the business structures, to, to, to prevent themselves from paying the most amount of money out. You know, just to, like just, just let me give you an example. You got you're gonna pay. There, there, there's no way of getting around paying taxes in in, mo, in 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 some cases, right? So you got a choice. You can buy a certain vehicle that gives you maximum tax benefits, right? And because they at a certain weight, and make the payment on that, or you can make payment to the IRS. Which one? You want? I'd rather make the payment on the vehicle, get that tax write off. And make that payment, then make a payment to give basically just giving it out there that you're not getting no return on that. At least I get to drive this nice car. That's right. That's right. You know, so you're gonna make you're gonna pay taxes somehow, but you want to minimize that to the the least amount legally possible. So people will go get that's why you see a lot of lawyers and uh, different people in the profession driving certain like BMW X5s because that vehicle, that vehicle was specifically designed for tax write-offs. Yeah, I was, look, there's there's another vehicle too. I want to say there's a a Mercedes that covers this considered a u a u a utility vehicle and something else. So it covers two tax categories. But, and I seen this on a it was on some TikTok. <laughs> the dude said. You get this vehicle into the year, write it off, and you use it as a taxing because under so and so code, it's considered a a, a utilitarian or some type of vehicle that falls right. under a certain benefit. So there's all type of stuff, but it's like you said, man, they don't teach it in school, and the schools where they do teach it, they price the poor people out because you can't go there to hang out with these kids to get the game because it's like thirty thousand a year for a friend to hang out to go to that school. See, all that guy is going to teach you is what's already written in the code. So yeah. how about you just go to the code and read it? Yeah, yeah. That's how I learned about it. I didn't go to a fancy school to learn these things. I started reading the code. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. When you start reading these codes, your head's going to spin. Because you're not used to reading words like that. You're not used to reading. And who put you up on game on the code? Well, how? How I got into the information I'm in now, seven years ago, I used to work with a, a, a gentleman who was teaching this this information, and um, his name was Jonah Bay. I used to I learned he he put me on reading the Constitution and reading the code, right? And I appreciate the brother. We don't work together anymore. We had a disagreement. You know how that goes. Um, and I read. And he he actually told me straight up, he said, when you're reading this stuff, it's going to hurt your head because you got to rewire your brain. Like whenever you're reading something that's very difficult to read, you're not familiar, it's going to bother you. It's going to give you a headache maybe because your brain is used to reading in a certain wavelength, a certain patty. Mm-hmm. Now you're trying to raise that level of knowledge, wavelength. The body is kind of kicking back at you. But if you keep reading it over and over and over and over again, guess what? You're going to build new neural pathways. And you get, and now when I read these things, it's like reading a regular book. Like people, I, I, I do seminars all the time, right? And I give something to read. I say, tell me what that means right there. They can't tell me because they're not used to reading that. Now, I read it. I said, this is what this means right here. Read this. This is it. And they're like, wow. How did you get there? Because I, it, it's nothing special. It's consistency. I kept reading it. I stayed with it. Even when it was bothering me, my eyes were watering. I kept reading it. There are a lot of people will hear me and say, yo, I can go read this, Lord. I'm warning you. 
It's going to take time for your brain to adjust to reading these legalese words. And you need to go get you some Black's Laws dictionaries. Black Law, the older, the better. Yes. yes. Invest in them. Invest. In, like I have a third edition Black Laws dictionary. I have a ninth and I have a sixth edition Black Laws dictionary. And trust me, they do change things around. They do. I, I, I read a first edition and it changed from the first to the eighth. And then another thing people are doing, yes, Black Laws Dictionary is great. But when you're reading a code, you need to go to the definitions of the, in that code, what they mean by that word. You see, because that, that's when a Black Law Dictionary is not going to help you. Because if I, they write code and they have a section that says definitions, you have to read what that definition means. So I can go to the uh, code and it'll say the United States means this in this code, but then I go to the education code and read United States. It'll have a different definition. Now people will say, well, why well, can the United States have two different definitions? Well, because in the IRS code, they ha define it for a specific reason. In the education code, it's defined so that every state can get their money for their schools. So they'll say United States means the 50 states in the education code. But in the IRS code, they'll say United States mean uh, the several states, the District of Columbia and the outlying lands. Of, that, that's what it'll say yeah. in that code. Yeah. So once you understand now, okay, there's, there's a difference here. So I, Black's Law Dictionary is not going to help me with that. You see? So read definitions based on the code, read the Black's Law Dictionary. I mainly read Black's Law's Dictionary, look up things that I want to see how they change the meanings of stuff. Because mm -hmm. that kid, because I can go, I'll go into a Black's Law's Dictionary and read the definition of person in that, in an older one, and then read it in a newer one. They, it'll have a different meaning. Mm. So the newer Black's Law Dictionary, to me, a jump. I want the old one. <clears throat> yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, they said, you know, put it in a book if you don't want somebody to see it. But like you, as you get further and further as far as people with Google looking up definitions rather than going through some of these old periodicals. I mean, That's I true. read some books that guys gave me when I was inside and they used to say, hey, man, don't let nobody read this and give it back. And they had marks on the pages because if a page was missing, you might get stabbed. For, for a page missing out the book. But the knowledge, like you said, I would read this stuff and literally I'd be sleepless because I was like, where they get this from? Why didn't I ever know about this on the street? I mean, some of this stuff was so crazy. And I mean, I couldn't, You, I would try to get copies of stuff when I could because I knew on the street I could never find this information again. But these people, they got it from somebody else who had got it from somebody else who had got it. And this is all stuff behind the wall that you would pass to other guys to read. And it's almost like a Native American knowledge where if you had to be there to get it. Right. Like one of, and another good resource is the GPO style manual, the government printing office manual. That's mm -hmm. the manual that the governments use to enter stuff into their computer and how to define stuff. And go to the section on uh, nationalities. That's an eye opener. Mm. That's that's an eye opener because most people, oh, I'm black, I'm African American, they go off these. Just think about it. Most of the stuff we 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 speak on is from hearsay. Is someone said this is it? You're right. We never really read it and looked these things up. The resources are out there for us to learn this stuff without having to go to a school, right? You know, you just you you don't have to go pay thousands of dollars to learn this stuff. But you just have to be willing to invest the time to research and look for the information. And sometimes, yes, you need someone to kind of steer you in the right direction. That's what I got when I first started in this, this field. Someone steered me towards it, but he couldn't make me read it. So I read it and I, man, I started to, whoa. I was like, I realized that a lot of the guys who were teaching some of the information I was teaching, they were lying or they didn't know what they were talking about because now I'm like this. If you're going to tell me something is true and so I could do something, especially in the in the law field, show me the law that says I can do it. Show me that. Don't tell me I could do all this stuff and 
blah, 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 but you ain't showing me the law that supports what you're saying because if I don't have a law that supports what I'm saying, then I'm doing something illegal. That's right. According to them. You see what I'm saying? And a lot of people do that. They teach people, oh, you can do this, discharge this and this. And like, okay, well, show me I can do that. Because right now I see people losing houses, cars, and all this other stuff because you're telling them they could do something. That was one of the things that happened with me when I first got into this. I had a lot of people telling me, and I even listened to some of these people and almost lost my property because I'm following all this nonsense mm. and no one showed me a law or even proof that it even worked. And then that caused me to... What really caused me to study was <laughs> I got a traffic ticket. And I was told, yeah, go in there and tell them that you're not the straw man and all this stuff, right? You know, you you probably heard this this, yeah. nonsense, right? You, you, I'm not the all cap. Tell them you this doing business is this and all this stuff. And this came from the person that I introduced me to this life, you know. And I went in there. I got that judge handed me my ass right back on a plate, okay. And end up charging me with more stuff. I end up paying more money. But instead of being upset at the person who told me to do it and being upset with the judge, I said, you know why you lost? Because you listened to him tell you that you can do that and you didn't study and find out what was the problem. I said, that will never happen again. So that's what caused me to dig into the law, read the law. I had to get handed, I had to get handled in court before I really, and then I went and learned. I said, okay, what he said wasn't even accurate. <laughs> he wasn't even close to accurate. When I understood, and it's like what I said earlier, this is a game. I cannot go into somebody's game, which is to those courts, so that's their game. They do that every day, day in, day out. This is their field. I can't go in there creating my own rules, mm -hmm. but they have rules. And their rules, there is remedy. You just got to know the rules. And once I learned the rule, now I can <laughs> safely go in there and know what I'm talking about and come out of there. Okay. But if you don't know the rules and you listen to some guy on YouTube, I tell people, don't listen to me. You better not. Take what I'm telling you, the law I'm giving you, go read it and add to it. Go dig into know what you're doing. Don't listen to me. Because I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a fan of financial advisor, but I show you the rules and the laws that tell you what you can do according to what they say. So that's that's the biggest thing I think in our community. What causes us to fail is we're not willing to put in the work to learn. We want somebody else to push a button to fix our problems. Yeah, that's what we look for as a people. And this is why all of these other communities are coming from other places and doing better than us. It's not because they're better than us. It's because they're willing to invest time, persistence, dedication into their self, their family, and their community. We, uh, most of us are just looking for the next BET show to come on. Uh, watch this the, the nonsense listening to the garbage on the rap talking about calling our women bees and hoes and stuff like that we're more interested in entertaining ourselves through sports and other avenues than entertaining ourselves through reading learning how to use that pen because that pen is a serious weapon if you know how to use it they've been using a pen on us for years the only thing that's going to beat a pen is a pen. Yes. That's the only thing you're going to beat that pen with is you learning how to use your pen and write your stuff, right? You're rebutting their nonsense that they coming at with you. That's the only thing that's going to beat that. None of this other fancy stuff that people are talking about. Mm. So how do people find your, your, uh, your show? I mean, what, where, what are the, the uh, my, my channel is hindsight radio. Just type in hindsight ready, or you could type in Akeem Barber, and you'll it'll pull up. Or account Akeem L. You, yeah, that's my radio name. That's not my my mom gave me the name Akeem, last name Barber. <laughs> I'm my type's an open book. <laughs> um, 
Uh, you, also, my website is akeemel.com, A K I E M E L.com. I'm on Instagram as Akeem is Limitless. Um, I have a Facebook page. You could just type up Akeem L on there. You'll find me on Facebook as well. And you'll see what I have to offer. A lot of things I do, I help people with trust. I help people with, um, of, you know, just organizing their estate. You know, the things like that. Organizing and setting yourself up for maximum asset protection. Maximum, so you can keep as much money as you can. You know, none of what I teach is to, to avoid taxes, to, to evade taxes, but it's to avoid as, avoid as much taxes as possible. That's legal. Tax evasion is illegal. <laughs> Tax avoidance is legal. And that's the things like Trump and all of them do. They, they know the rules. We need to learn these rules. We have to learn those rules. And if, if you're not going to learn those rules, you have no chance of even surviving. You know, you, you, you don't have a chance. You're not going <laughs> to be able to compete. And as you look, things are getting a little harder. But it doesn't have to affect you. See, my I have my own individual economy. And that's my mindset. My mindset is my economy. And I think wealth, prosperity, peace, love, those are the things I continue to think on. I don't take on the, the whole attitude, oh, we're doing a recession and believing in all that stuff. Because what you believe in is what's going to yeah. come you. I just told somebody that today. I said, man, look, you know, I, I'm not going to entertain that word. They use that word to create mass fear and also imprison people that they want to buy into that. I said, look, I didn't, I, 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 uh, I got out when it was one of the worst economies. I had no idea what was going on because I was happy for to be free and my mind was in a different place. So I wasn't impacted by that. So when you think about that, like you said, you create your own reality and they know what they're doing when they keep saying these catch words on social media and, and right. on the news and people are like, oh my God, I can't, oh, everything's going to hell. The world is in, oh man, at the end. The, the news media and all of those places, they tell you in these times, don't, don't get into stocks while they're getting into stocks. See why? Because you think if more people got into stocks now, what does it do? It drives the prices up. The more buyers and not as many sellers, it's going to drive the price of everything up. So they 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 create these narratives to tell people, don't do this now, don't do that. Oh, stay away from. Uh, uh. You, you can lose your money, and, and then you never invest. But it actually, this is the time to do it now when it's down. This yeah. is the time. Yeah. This is the time to invest, and no reward becomes comes without risk. Yeah, you can't stand on the sideline expecting to be scoring a touchdown or getting any any accolades when you're not participating. And um, you know, I've I've through this whole last couple of years, I've stayed traveling and seeing things, and I just kind of laughed at myself because once you get out your bubble whatever community and you start seeing what's going on. You're like, man, people are making money right now. I've seen people, right. I've seen some people during, you know, people during the sea, you know, this whole lockdown and they were still spending money buying million dollar cars and watches, $50,000. And everybody was talking about, man, you better save your money. I said, dude, look, man, you're tapped into a different energy source than these people. Cause I've seen some dudes balling. I mean, they're still making six figures a month. So, you know, it, it's all about what you buy. And most of these people, they don't even have social media. They're like, I, don't, I don't even know. You know, they don't listen to none of that. Not getting the programming. No. Not being no. programmed to believe that this is a hard time. See, like, yeah. when you, came out, yeah. you had no point of reference to go off of, right? So you were coming from the bottom, and all you could do was go up. Yes, yes. So you were just like, I just got to get it on. I don't care what's going on. I'm going to make it happen. And that's what it is. If you could just understand that, that it's really not about the economy. It's really about your mindset. That's right. All mindset. It's all how you see things. Everything you are today is based off some perception, conception of yourself. It's all based off what people told you you should be or shouldn't be. It's all you. You are a, 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 a combination of all the ideas you had before. That's who you are, and you have to. I had a, I had a, I had a, I had a revelation in my life where I had to come to terms with I didn't know anything. 
I was completely dumb. All the stuff I thought I knew, I didn't know. And that's what people got to say. You know, you know what? I have to really humble myself and know that I don't know anything and start from scratch. Yeah. And they, they, like with religion, you had asked me earlier, that's how I was able to break free from Jehovah's Witnesses is because I had to say, well, maybe they weren't telling me the whole story. And then I, you know, I went and bought Bibles. You know, I got like right here sitting on my desk. This is just a few of my Bibles. <laughs> I got three different versions of the Bible because guess what? In each one of these, it says something different. You no, see you're right. You got, you got, a, it's a humbling experience. And, and um, I wish I would have found my moment before I went and robbed that bank and, and, and sit with the handcuffs on. Because when I sat in there, I realized that, man, I didn't know shit. I really, I, was, I sat there, I'm like, man, I played myself. I I thought I was, you know, I went to school, had some college credit. Man, I didn't know shit. And, um, you know, well, me, once you can get past that ego, it changes your life. Let me ask you. You going through all of that, and it's unfortunate. It's not something that someone wants to do, be spend a time in prison, right? But think about this. Just think about this. Look at the lives you're able to touch just by having that experience. Think about that. You know, that's like, you, you don't want that, but if you didn't have it, do you think you would have the profound effect on people that you need? Sometimes we have to go through some things to be able to reach other people. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You know what I'm saying? It's not a good experience. And I, you know, I'm fortunate for me, and I thank God that I didn't. Maybe God knew I wasn't the guy that could do a lot of time. But you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, he, can't, he ain't going to be able to handle that. He, little guy like him, uh -uh. I, I, I'm just going to just give him this taste. Everybody is given, I think we all given the medicine we can tolerate. Yeah. Yeah. push us into that direction that we need to go. And as long as we're using it to affect people, yeah. to change people, yeah, and, and not allow ourselves to get caught up in the hype of things, right? Like you have all these channels that just want to talk about negative stuff all the time, gossip about this person, that person, and that person. And I, I did a consultation with a big YouTuber before, before you, and he would say, oh, you got to do this. I just can't do it. Like I got, you know, a little over 9,000 followers, 9,200 some odd followers, right? Yes. Well, do I want a major following? I would like that. But that comes, I would like to get there knowing that I'm elevating people's consciousness and not doing it by showing them the, the, the street, the gutter, you know, that's, I just couldn't, I can't, I don't think, I, I know I'm not that type of person that want to keep putting the negative out there because we got enough people doing it already. There's already enough people doing that. I, I don't need to do it at to the to the fire. Let me just keep pumping in. And, and I know a lot of people watch it and I know that I am affecting people because people call me every day. Hey, man, I saw your channel. I like what you're talking about. And so I know what my numbers say on YouTube is... <laughs> <laughs> maybe they're not all that accurate. You know, I don't know. You're definitely making a difference, man. And um, I appreciate you coming on the show. And we're going to do, we might make this like a weekly to have you come back and chop it up and spit game because we need more brothers like yourself mm -hmm. leading by example and putting a face behind a voice because, you know, people hear from me and like, oh, Herc, man, you, you, oh, man, you talking all that. And they hear from somebody else like, oh, hold on. He, you know, he's spitting some game too. And then they, it, it's, it's a point of reflection, and the more we put it out there, we can shape a narrative that can overall shape the universe, and that's what I'm looking right. to do. Right. We just got to offset the negative balance. That's all we're doing. Yeah. A, we're leaning more negative, right? But the more people stay positive, we first of all, a lot of that negative stuff, negative stuff is not going to affect your house if you're not vibing in it for the most part. Mm -hmm. Stay away from it. Keep your mind off of it. Think about your prosperity, your health, your wealth, and, and it just doing good. And when you see the negative, just get away from it. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's somebody watching it and you, you out there doing your thing on the street, hey, it's not too late. You, you, can, you will be able to make lots of money outside of the street 
when you go legit. It's, it's so much money out there. And you ain't got to. I know when I got off the streets and got that job, the first thing I was able to do was sleep. <laughs> sleep. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Not look over my shoulder. You know, I'm, I'm making, you know, th- that was that was worth more than anything. That right there, that peace of mind. And I know there's somebody that need to hear that, you know, that they don't have that peace of mind, but they want it. Yeah. Go, go, go take that job. It ain't going to pay you a whole lot at first, but it's going to train you how to be persistent, consistent, and be a reliable person. And you don't have to accept that little bit of pay, but you'll eventually get it. You keep your mind looking for more. You see, I, I started out $3.35 30, an hour. I couldn't even buy an outfit with that. My mother said, well, what you do is you just buy one thing at a time. Next, you know, I had a closet full of things. I'm taking her advice. I just, I bought a shirt one week. I bought a pair of pants one week, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that's how I did it. Once it, you, and in order to be successful, you got to go through hard times. You yeah. got to fail to be successful. You got to. It's no, failure is a prerequisite to success. It's a part of it. And we just got to get used Nobody to it. Nobody wants that part, though. Everybody, everybody just wants the success. They want yeah. they, you having all these followers. They just want the followers. They don't yeah. want to make the, the bunch of crappy videos yeah. first. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But uh, that's what it takes. Yeah. It's, all the guys who were big YouTubers started off making crappy videos. Yeah. Period. And yeah. then now they're big time because they put in the work. They yeah. was dedicated. I when, when I had so I had a few thousand ch- followers. I said, "Wow, I didn't even know because I wasn't really pushing YouTube like that." But I was making if you go back and watch all my, they were crappy, and some of them now are still crappy because I'm not a all the editing stuff. I don't, I, I, I just, I don't, have, I don't take the time to edit any, <laughs> any of the stuff. I just put it out there raw. Yeah. You know? So, but anyway, man, I really appreciate you having me on, though. Uh, hey. Taking. I appreciate it too. And, and I know our audience will appreciate it because you bring a different perspective and what you offer is uh, unlike anything else, any of our other um, people who have appeared, any of our guests have offered before. So. Okay. Well, thank look you. Forward to it. I look forward to it too. You have a good one. Peace. All right. Big Herc 916. Fresh out. Stop walking around with a crusty butt, smelly ball sack and a funky hoo-ha. Big Herc said, wash that ass. Pick you up a t-shirt at freshhouseseries.com. <laughs>